Hello friends and welcome to an exclusive preview of the Disney Shanghai Resort. My wife and I were able to score preview tickets for the week before the park opened to the general public because we are Disney employees. So we're going to walk you through our experience on that day. The Disney Shanghai Resort has six main areas. Mickey Avenue as you enter, Adventure Isle, Treasure Cove, Fantasyland, Tomorrowland, and the Gardens of Imagination. Of course, as you drive up, as we did in a taxi, uh, you get off the highway and you can see the familiar Mickey ears, and you drive into an area with some very nice fountains, and you can see the castle alpha in the distance. We were dropped off by the taxi driver at the transportation center and walked down some very wide parkways. There is actually a train station in Shanghai that ends here, so that's quite nice and convenient for anyone needing to get to this park. The park entrance seems to surround an area called the Disney Town Lakeshore. We weren't able to explore that particular part. But up over here by the ticket entrance is a section called Disney Town. This would be the equivalent of Downtown Disney, or what is now Disney Springs down in Florida, with a cheesecake factory and other shops. This day was particularly busy for all of the employees of Disney, the vendors and people that made this park possible. We heard there were 30,000 people attending. Up at the front, you can of course see that iconic entrance with the Mickey in the flowers, the entranceway into the archways, and into the Main Street type area with the castle in view, the very large castle in this particular case. Now the Main Street area here is actually called Mickey Avenue, and it's deliberately smaller than the Main Streets in the other areas to make way for the gardens of imagination that are in front of the castle. Even though it was small, we found that when you go off to the sides or around the corners, there's actually quite a bit of stuff there, from various shops to various places to eat, all the kinds of things that you expect in all of the Disney parks, with all the different architecture that borrows from the European style, American colonial style, kind of a mishmash of styles, just to give you that feeling of going down a main street. Remy's Patisserie, very French-looking place, a very wonderful food actually we ate here we thought it was one of the best deals in the park some of the most appetizing options on display ranging from pastries that looked like Mike Wazowski's eyeball donuts different tarts and vegetable options some of the best chocolate chip cookies I've ever had anywhere and these beautiful sandwiches which uh, we sampled a little bit of Remy's patisserie quite nice lots of nice little touches here we found it particularly funny that the designated smoking section was right next to uh, the fireworks building which was a display you couldn't go in there uh, but it was sure fun nonetheless Adventure Isle as you go counterclockwise around the Gardens of Imagination is the first place you come to this would be the equivalent of Adventureland in the other parks, but it's themed uh, times a thousand, centering around a mountain with a waterfall going down it. This being a trial period, there were some attractions that were not open to us, including the Roaring Rapids water ride where you'd get wet, although they were cycling it through, so we did get a sneak peek. But the main attraction here seems to be Camp Discovery, which is unique to any Disney park. We've never quite seen an attraction like this that almost gives you the feeling of being Indiana Jones or some kind of explorer in an unknown territory. Again, centered around this large mountain, you basically strap on these harnesses that are attached to a series of tracks up above you to keep you well and safe as you go through these different obstacle courses. It's like a ropes course where you can choose one of three different difficulty levels, including this incredibly cool ledge that goes around a waterfall. This here is the area behind the main waterfall where it looks like a temple has been unearthed, a secret temple. As you can see, uh, little bridges you can go across over that. This is a really fun, really neat concept in general for an attraction that we really got a big kick out of. Adventure Isle is also home to the Tarzan show. If you're familiar with the old Tarzan show that used to show at Animal Kingdom, this was a little bit like that in that it did feature some aerial acrobatics, but instead of the bicycles and the roller skates, was replaced with some traditional Chinese acrobatic. It was a really, really beautiful and uh, exciting, thrilling show that followed the Tarzan story. It was actually quite touching at some moments. Just seeing these folks up in the air doing their acrobatics without any safety net below was uh, th thrilling enough. We really did enjoy this show quite a bit. 
Continue counterclockwise and you'll encounter an area exclusive to the Shanghai Park called Treasure Cove. Really capitalizing off of the popularity of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. This one is pirate themed from beginning to end. Around a lake area here with a beautiful view across to Adventure Land, where there are boats and ships and shipwrecks all across the sides. And the surrounding area was themed like a pirate shanty town. One of the centerpieces of this area visually was the Siren's Revenge, which is an experience, a walkthrough experience, I would liken to the Swiss Family Robinson attraction that you've probably been on in Walt Disney World or Walt Disney Land. Across the way from Siren's Revenge is one of the many eateries that dot throughout the park. This one in particular was Barbosa's Bounty, which features oh, your typical barbecue pork rice. Um, had some grilled squid, a little bit of seafood, but mainly meat. What was just really neat about this area was how themed it was and how there were these different alleys and nooks and crannies that really evoked the Pirates of the Caribbean movie. There were these boats called the Explorer Canoes, and I'm pretty sure they were on tracks, but what a fun little experience to canoe around. And, of course, Captain Jack Sparrow was on hand uh, to do meet and greet. He was quite popular on that day. Go a little further down Pirate's Cove and you come out of the shanty town and into an area that's themed a little bit more like an old Spanish fort. This fort was called Fort Snobbish and it housed some gift shops, uh, of course some toilets here, but the main area that this is masking and housing is the main attraction, which is the Pirates of the Caribbean battle for the sunken treasure ride. So popular that we had some policemen who were policing the line, which snaked for about two hours outside of the main queue area. Once you get through the queue, you go on this ride, and I honestly have said for the longest time that Universal has been eating Disney's lunch when it comes to fun, exciting new rides with the latest technology in their Harry Potter land. This ride blows all of them away. The old Pirates of the Caribbean ride is dead. This is going to be a brand new experience for you, which starts off when Johnny Depp as Captain Jack Sparrow materializes and then takes you on this incredible adventure to the bottom of the sea. I could not say enough good things about this ride. It's just amazing, and you just have to experience it for yourself. Come out to the back of the castle and uh, continue counterclockwise around, and you come to the Fantasyland area of the park. Like the other Fantasylands done up in this sort of European-style uh, architecture, looks very Pinocchio-esque with uh, places to eat. We went to Pinocchio's Village Kitchen, which was a large counter service restaurant serving Mickey-shaped pizzas and other things that you could grab uh, from the counter and take back to an area to eat. We had a Mickey-shaped pizza, we had a seafood lasagna, and a seafood pasta, all of which was a little bit more expensive than we expected. But the place did have a lot of fun themed areas to eat. We opted for the porch out by the front. There's another water area around this too, which houses the Voyage to the Crystal Grotto ride, which unfortunately was closed. What was available, however, was Captain Hook Meet and Greet and Peter Pan's Flight, which we stood in line for about two hours for. This is an update of the classic ride that you'll find in Disneyland and Disney World, updated in every respect. Still a darkroom ride, but the latest in projection technology, really beautiful theming some much better audio animatronics. It was exactly the same footprint and theme as the ride that you'll find in the other parks, but of course the ante was upped with everything considerably with the newest technology. Just well worth the two hour wait just to experience. If you continue around, you go to a portion of Fantasyland that is the 100 Acre Wood, where Pooh's Honey Pot Spin takes the place of the classic teapot ride in the other parks, as well as the Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, which is transplanted verbatim from what you'll find in Disney World. Also in this area is the new Snow White Minecart Ride. Tomorrowland is the final stop along the route. Tomorrowland looked very different, whereas the other Disney parks have taken kind of a retro Tomorrowland look. This one looks kind of like Tomorrow Might Look. There's a Dumbo-style ride, uh, the spaceship-themed. Of course, it's all centered around this Tron ride, which is extremely popular, and it's the thrill ride for the park, the roller coaster. Also here is a Stitch Encounter, which is a turtle talk, if you're familiar with that, in Disney World, but with Stitch uh, instead. 
The Buzz Lightyear Space Ranger spin is here, but it has been greatly improved with uh, guns that you can actually pull loose and freely shoot any direction you want. And the theming itself looks less like toys and more kind of like a Buzz Lightyear video game or cartoon with targets that are actually screened so that you can tell when you hit them because they do react. The Tron light cycle ride extends outside a little bit so that you can see the light cycles that they pass through. The theming for this ride was absolutely incredible. From the sounds to the sights, you really feel like you're in the Tron universe with these really unique light cycles. For a roller coaster, the fact that you're sitting on these cycles uh, forward really was a great feel. Very ingenious the way that they put you in here where you just pull the handlebars to you and everything comes around. Looks like it might be uncomfortable. It's not at all. It's a super comfortable roller coaster through the Tron universe. And essentially, I would liken it to Rock and Roller Coaster in uh, Disney World, but with the Tron theme. Most beautiful, however, at night, where all the lights are apparent and all the LEDs and the colors really come through at Tomorrowland. There's a large stage at the end of it where there's a DJ playing music and you can do some dancing. It just really highlights that Tron theme and that gorgeous, beautiful change in colors that you get throughout the entire Tomorrowland area. I can see that they'll probably have a lot of events here on these wide open spaces. Unlike Disney World today, there's no magic band system, so all the fast passes are done at these kiosks. There was also a Marvel Universe tent thrown in here where you could have encounters, much like the Star Wars launch bay, which also existed here. You could just basically do a meet and greet with Spider-Man and do some small things. I'm going to leave you, however, a little bit about the castle and the Gardens of Imagination. Disney chose to do something a little different here. Instead of having a traditional long main street, they have this Gardens of Imagination out in front of the castle. Very well appropriate to China. As you remember, has had this one-child policy for quite some time, and so Disney knows that many families are going to be visiting here with one child and many adults, parents and grandparents. And those older adults are going to need a place to sit and chill out. The Gardens of Imagination are to provide that place for them. The castle itself, like everything else here, is bigger and grander than at any of the other parks. You can walk right through the archways into the castle itself where you're in this large rotunda. If you look up in this large rotunda, you see a gorgeous chandelier. Around the sides of the rotunda are different murals that depict the Disney princesses. There's also Cinderella's Royal Banquet Hall here for eating and the Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique. A very unique feature, though, is out behind the castle and a little bit below under the ground is an Alice in Wonderland-themed hedge maze. But the castle itself is actually home to an attraction all its own. It's called Storybook Castle, and uh, the attraction is called the Once Upon a Time Adventure. Once you go through the queue line of this walkthrough, you are ushered into a room with the magic storybook. And you watch as the storybook comes to life in three dimensions right in front of you. And a passageway opens behind you that leads to a staircase. And this staircase winds around that center rotunda up through the castle to the very top. And it's really neat because you can look down through these stained glass windows at the people down below. And all the way along the staircases are these reliefs carved in what appears to be marble of the different Disney princesses. They're really going for the princess theme uh, in this regard. Uh, from Mulan to the princess and the frog, so cool, all the way up the top. When you do get to the top, you're treated to a walk-through experience of Snow White. The mirror speaks to you. You walk through the mirror and into an area where you see the cartoons essentially come to life in three dimensions in front of you in these little pastiches. It's a really neat effect that comes through a lot better in person than it does on the video. It walks you through the whole story of Snow White and then takes you up to the top where you can go down again. Now one thing the Bic and I found actually, uh, as everybody else was going down, there was this other area you could find. We were the only ones there, but it did say it was open. So we walked through the door and sure enough, here is a garden up in the top in the center of the castle, right in between all the spires, with a little fountain, little places to sit, and some greenery. Absolutely beautiful little hidden area that we discovered. And then at the end of it was a stained glass window that looks straight down from the front of the castle at the stage area below. Much like the castle, my impression of Shanghai Disneyland was just that it was so much bigger, so much more refined, so much better themed than many of the other parks we've been to. It's clearly Disney's newest generation of park, and we hope you can come out like us and visit it soon.